Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, I'd like to introduce you to my old friend, Gail Hasen. She is launching a new podcast and she's also developing a new book, both with the same title, A Small Medium at Large. Gail has many fascinating stories to tell. I've known her for a long time because she's been quite active in the parapsychology community. She's a very gifted psychic. She's worked with shamans around the world. Gail is a fascinating individual because even though she never graduated from high school. She holds an honorary doctoral degree from the National Academy of Sciences in Mongolia. Gail is based in Sebastopol, California, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Gail. It's a real pleasure to be with you on New Thinking Aloud. Thank you so much for having me as your guest today. We've known each other a long time for several decades. I know that you are a close friend of many of my close friends. You have some fabulous life stories to to tell. And this is an opportunity, and I'm really delighted and proud to be able to introduce you to the New Thinking Aloud audience. I'm pretty sure our audience members are, are going to love you. And w one of the things that really really struck me in reading over the manuscript of, of your biography, which I know you've been working on for 20 years or more, is, is that you, I, I didn't appreciate how much trauma you had to endure in your young life. I, I think that that trauma makes me who I am today, so I have no hard feelings about any of the trauma. Also, it enabled me to have compassion for other people's traumas in a way that, say, a therapist who's sitting in an office may not really be able to have that same kind of connection with a person who's been that traumatized. The other thing I discovered with it is that I'm sure it's what really opened up my so-called psychic side or whatever term you want to use, intuitive. I think that those particular situations help that part of myself to expand as a young child. And I've noticed when I've interviewed with other people, um, I used to do something called Dr. Dr. Gale, where Dean had me write with people who would contact the Institute of Noetic Sciences when they were having scary experiences or fears about something that was going on they couldn't understand. I discovered that a lot of these people have shut down their psychic or intuitive side or put up a wall for it. And it's actually the trauma where they actually opened up to it. So it's, it's not in every situation, but I do think that some of those kind of childhood trauma things does help to have some people really expand their awareness further. What was unique to me in your story is that not only did you experience physical, emotional, and sexual trauma as a young person, but you came to forge strong, lasting, loving relationships with those same people. Uh, my instinct would have been to, to get away from those relationships as fast as possible, but you seem to move more deeply into them, in, and the result turned out to be, I think, relatively positive for you. Very positive and healing. In fact, uh, my husband David just left oh, to be where to get some work done at my brother's uh, car place, and my mother has an apartment, and he was going to drop her off at the apartment. She's 94 now, the same mother of the stories that you read about, and all she does is call me up just crying about how I'm the most wonderful daughter and how much she loves me. So to go from the point where the two of us used to just tell each other how much we hated each other with a passion has now grown to this passion of loving each other. 
And to me, that's things I like to share because I hear about people's stories and they're not willing to forgive. And forgiveness is beneficial for all the people involved. So it's a great learning and a great teaching. And you have to wait, you know, my father used to always say, where there's life, there's hope. So you can never say a relationship is ruined forever. You don't know until you're dead. <laughs> you could maybe <laughs> heal it in between. <laughs> the same with, I have three children from three different men and they all get along wonderfully. The children, the men, we, you know, we all have a nice relationship. Sometimes I have a little difficulty with the, the wives they marry. They don't want to accept me necessarily, but we always open them all open heartedly. I thought another title for this interview rather than small, medium, at large might be a little woman with a big heart. <laughs> I think that should be one of my next stories I put on medium. <laughs> So, yeah. I know we're going to jump around a lot because uh, you have such a diverse and fascinating life. One of the most interesting episodes that you went through was with Werner Earhart, the founder of the Earhart Seminars Trading Training. Uh, I know back in the 1970s, everybody in the San Francisco Bay Area knew about Werner. Today, he's pretty much, I, I guess I'd have to say, a forgotten figure, but... I thought so, too. And yeah. then I just typed his name or something in, and he's still carrying on. At, and he's 90, I think, or something, <laughs> or 85, I don't know. Yeah. But when I checked it out, I was I was shocked to see that he was still mm -hmm. teaching like to businesses and corporations. And <laughs> it was surprising. You were involved with Werner even before he set up the EST program uh, when he was involved in mind dynamics. And they used to demonstrate psychic functioning as part of that seminar. It got incorporated into the EST program program as well is one of the things that really impressed me about all of those, uh, including Silva Mind Control, those kinds of programs that were involved. But I think that was your first sort of formal engagement with doing psychic work. That was, as a child, I used to do a lot of, now I know the word is called astral uh, I think astral travel or astral projection. I'm not, I think it's one of those two words. But as a child, I didn't know what to call it. So I called it flying. And I've since met another person who experienced the same thing. And he used to call it flying also. So it might be a common word used for children. And so with those things, that's how I sort of started out with, I used to travel around my house and see everybody sleeping in the bed, including myself. And I used to go, it was a three-story house, and I used to go from the top of the steps to the bottom in one leap. And these were not actually with my body, but it seemed like it was because, for, of course, I'm a child, and of course, I don't know what astral projection is, but it was only after all these different experiences like Werner and others that later in my 20s and 30s when it would happen, I started to travel further so that I wasn't just in my house. I realized I could go above my house and I could go above my city and I could go above my state and I could go above the whole planet. And uh, But that really started as a child. But things like the Werner Earhart experience gave me tools and opened up, you know, as much as I have of things I don't like about Werner, I'm also very grateful to have had them show me what these abilities were that for me, in the classroom, there were only, me and my brothers were the only kids in the whole entire uh, class. It was a hundred and, it'd be anywhere from a hundred to 150 people, but we were Werner's second class that he ever taught of anything ever anywhere. So that's how far back we go. He didn't have a car that could make it across the Golden Gate Bridge to the marina where we were in some very wealthy person's home having these lectures. So he said he would used to use his mind to try and fix the battery or whatever it was as he was coming across to make sure his car could get to the other end. And when we started, 
I didn't know how at that time it cost $150 to take the class. And I was living with my boyfriend in San Francisco in an apartment. Mind you, I was 15 at the time. And my father was living in a pickup truck, traveling around trying to find where he was gonna settle in Northern California. And I said, I saw this lecture and I want you to go see it because I figured maybe Mr. Frugal would part with some money. And I always tell everyone, you don't understand how frugal when I say my father was frugal. He would hang the, the dental floss that was used on a light bulb to dry it out so he could reuse it again the next day. So, I mean, like, there's a lot of floss in a, in a dental floss you need. You can't use it all. You know, like a new piece. <laughs> but when he saw the lecture and the demonstration that a woman could be given just because it was mostly, it was actually only women that I remember that were demonstrators, they called them. I became one later. The demonstrator, my father sat there and saw that this woman could just be given the name and the age and the city that someone was in. And she could tell you everything physically wrong with the person. And that blew my father away. He was so, so he immediately signed up and he took the course. And when he got out of the course, not only did he pay for me, he paid even for my boyfriend to go. He paid for my mother, my brothers, we all went. And this was a lot of money for a man that was living on welfare and social security or whatever. I mean, I think he had social security then yet. No, he was just on welfare. So I'm so thrilled. And of course, I don't know if this is for other people, but you always want to think your father is proud of you or... And never in his life had he ever been as proud of me as he was when he would saw, saw me in this class. Because I was able to do those things within the first two days. It was always two weekends, these courses. And the graduation would be on the second Sunday and, you know, the second week, second Sunday, and your certificate you received. I still have all the papers from back then. I have a whole file on him. And we were like in awe that we could do healing. So my motivation at the time was, wow, if I could help to heal people, this is this to me felt like the most wonderful thing I could possibly do. I didn't realize till a zillion years later when I told Russell Targ the story and he said to me, you were a shell, you were a shell being used to sell the course. And I had never thought of it that way. I, you know, I, Then it was considered like an honored position, like whoever Werner would choose. And it was a very cult-like experience being involved with the mind dynamics. They would have a place in the office that had files with these little cards that would have the name and the ages that they called the cases. And they would have a file where there were cases that they would find that when people would try to do them, they had a lot of difficulty. So they would remove them from the pile of cases and put them in the special cases file. And they brought me in to test me on that, and I was able to do all their difficult cases that nobody else could do. So at Mind Dynamics, they trained me how to not only be a, um, mind you, this is all for free, everyone's working for free, climbing their way to be able to be his assistant or his helper. And um, we, we would do these, I would do amazing on them. They were blown away. So they then started using me in front of their crowds and um, it would be in a hotel, in different places. My last experience with Werner Earhart was him regressing me uh, on video. I've never seen the video, but it was at the Jack, was, the, was at the St. Francis Hotel. We often had things at the Jack Tar, but this was a big, big event that, you know, a lot of people came in the ballroom there. And I didn't even know he was going to regress me. He just picked me up out of the crowd and said, we want to use you as this demonstration of regression to past lives. And he didn't really know what he was doing. How much experience does he have in regressing someone to past lives? Well, it turned out there were these secrets in my family and my father was in the audience listening, meaning one of the secrets being that I didn't know I wasn't from the mother who said she was my mother. Instead, I was my father's girlfriend's daughter, a love child being raised by his wife since birth. Well, I kept coming up with the dates when all these trauma things happened and my father was sitting there in the audience going, oh my God, how is she doing this? <laughs> like I said, 1957, I said, something very heavy happened. Turned out my dad went to prison in 1957. <laughs> so my criticism of Werner was that as he regressed me, all of a sudden he said, okay, well now we're gonna stop. 
And he kind of left me at the edge of a cliff somewhere in Ireland, it seems like, when I've seen photos, and just said, okay, now we're stopping. And it took me many years to get back to that place and finish off this regression in some kind of a body work I was doing. So then he, my dad had been the person who had been su supplying him with some of the materials that he was using in the course. So he invited my dad for the special dinner when he was announcing that he was going to start EST. And my father said he never, you know, he couldn't, you know, he was so thrilled to be one of the chosen few picked to be at this dinner. And he had given Werner a book called, which, by the way, if any of you listeners have a chance to get hold of, I highly recommend it. He gave it to me as a teenager and I have it to this day. And it will answer any spiritual or questions that you may have of life and death in there. It's called Thinking and Destiny. And it was written by Harold Percival. And I just saw it in Dean's library, so I know they've reissued it and you can get current copies. Highly recommend it. My dad said it after he gave it to Werner, when he gave back the book, he saw the material being used in the, <laughs> in the next classes. So I think they pulled on all these different modalities, you know, from the Rosicrucians, the L. Ron Hubbard, and all these things to make his particular course. And when he told um, Alexander Everett, who was the founder of Mind Dynamics, that he was leaving, I was in the office at that time because I was also doing office work. And the whole, like he was the number one leader of conferences or what workshops that they had there. He was an amazing salesman. And so to lose him, it's, I, I don't even know that Mind Dynamics lasted many more years after that. I'm not sure, you know, what happened. As he has the meeting with my dad in it, he says to everybody, do you realize we can make millions with this? So this was the beginning of EST. And I, I did go to a couple of EST trainings because one of the things about being an old uh, student is you got either discounts or even free uh, entrance to take more uh, classes. And there were great techniques that they taught you. Like if you couldn't sleep, there was a sleep technique. If you could, were having headaches. And these things really did work and help people. And during the time, I was feeling that I'm helping these people. I don't know who they are. I, I'm raised, we were raised vegans with no doctors or dentists. So I had no medical information. And yet I could tell the names of the prescriptions that were in the blood of the people. That's how sharp I got at this. In the beginning, when you started, you would be going into this little workshop in your mind and you would put the person's body in there that you were imagining because you didn't know the person. All you heard was a name and an age and a city. I was doing hundreds of them and I got to a point where I, my, I would know the phones before they were ringing. I would know who was going to call. All the things started rapidly, quickly increasing like that for me, which makes me wonder what would I be like now at 66 had I continued doing his process like that. But instead, I started to find, you know, which I think your audience would be aware of, that there can be entities and things out there of a dark or negative energy that try to attach on to a living species or person. And remember, you know, I'm 16 and a half by this point because I worked there for a year and a half. So I was somewhere around 16 and a half. And I call up Werner and I say, I, I need to speak to you. I say, there's this entity since this last, I did some people that were about to die and I can't seem to get rid of some negative thing that's following me. And I'm afraid that if I close my eyes, he's going to take over me. They said, and I spoke to the secretary and to him and, and years of giving volunteer at work there. You create your own reality. That was my whole answer. <laughs> so I called up my father, who was a spiritual man, and said, I don't know what to do. I'm scared to death. I'm in the city. He's up here in Northern California. So he tells me you have to face it and you have to go, you know, tell the entity to leave you. It is no right to be with you. And I had an amazing experience exercising this thing out of my field or space or whatever this was. And I never would do anything with Werner again after that day. 
After that, I said, these people don't care about me. They're not protecting you. I learned later on in years of studying with lots of other wonderful teachers who never became my guru, like Werner was to all of us, which also was a great lesson to never take in any of the, you saw there was everything then. You had the Hare Krishnas, you had the, the, the fat boy up in Washington. I mean, there was so much of that in the 70s here that it was like, pick your guru, you know. So that lesson taught me to never put another person above me in that way and never to not have, you know, critical thinking about what they're telling you or what you're doing with them. So I thank Werner for those lessons I learned for him, from him. And I didn't give up all my possessions to some other guy and live in a tent, you know. <laughs> but I think what happened is, which you might know in Est, Originally, the first few classes were taught where they were using actual bodies as the case, and it was to heal the sick. It later turned into psychological profiles instead, where you would put the person's head on your head and then start saying what the person was like. I think I might not have been the only one who was having some scary experiences looking into diseased bodies over and over and, to, and doing hundreds of them. So I decided never to do any of that ever again. And that whatever came to me naturally in my dreams, in my auditory hearing of things, whatever ways that happened, I would accept those, but I would never do anything like what he had taught me again. And I had enough psychic experiences after that, that they know, but I often always wonder what would I have been like? Because it was so, you know, it was such a sharp fine tuning thing and really, it's remote viewing. You're going into some other place and you're looking at what the sicknesses of the persons are. And I'd spend a week every night working on the person, covering them in light, golden rays, whatever I thought was a, a like a healing form. And sometimes I would get, you know, when there were actually people I knew who's their mother or something like that, I would get a call later. I don't know what you did, but my mother's been wonderful now. <laughs> so... You know, I don't know what came or, or whatever of it, but it was an experience that also showed me I had these abilities before even finishing the course to be told, now you can have a certificate and you can do this. And uh, it gave me a lot of confidence in that area. And it also made my father very proud of me. So we were hooked and we were groupies until I had my awakening. <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, it was an amazing experience. And then I meet Russell Targ years later and find out that Werner had donated $50,000 to the Stanford research. So I felt like, oh, oh, good. I'm glad somebody got some money. <laughs> <laughs> you write about another important lesson you learned. If I remember correctly, this time you're in Mexico with the Huichol Indians. You you have a a lover who is a member of the community there, and uh, who struck you. He hit you uh, for no apparent reason. And I think you write that that was the moment when you determined never to let a man strike you again that way. It was a it was a very pivotal moment in my life because I didn't wasn't sure whether I would ever be go home ever again, or I would I didn't know the amount of fear at being in a place where you've never been before that has no roads and you've only walked through a mountain for 16 hours to get there. <laughs> the feeling of fear when I had that experience was that I didn't know if I would see my home or my family or my children again. What was I doing going, back then I had one child, what was I doing going off into the mountains? <laughs> You know, but it turned out to be, you know, a whole nother opening of a cultural experience for me that I, I, I don't regret of anything about having done. The gentleman that we're talking about, Miguel, has passed away. And uh, I continued to sort of be in his life from then. In fact, it was in my house that he was visiting, which was, you know, maybe two years after that incident that the phone call came that his mother had passed away. And it turned out we were the ones together in her special little temple. They have special temples they build next to their house to honor the ancestors of their families. 
And we had gone in there because we were going to go back to California together and he was going to travel with us. And the mother did a whole special ceremony just on the two of us. And that was the last time he ever saw his mother. And to find out in my house on the phone, I'm the first person to tell him he's lost his mother. It's an odd chain of events, but it's the way it was meant to be. So in that moment, it was the conviction of if I get out of this mountain and live <laughs> and nobody abducts me here, <laughs> I will never, I had it found an inner strength that I'd never had all the other years that I've had. And I'm not sure why men always felt free to do that to me. I have no idea, but I, it, it ended there and it never happened ever again. Well, if I recall correctly, uh, it started with your father and you were rather young at the time. Seven, seven years old. I wanted food. I was complaining that we didn't have any food. <laughs> Because when everyone went to school, everybody had a sandwich and a drink and whatever. And, you know, my mother would give me a carrot. So all I'd have in the bag would be is this carrot because they were vegans, strict vegans. And um, I would be made fun of in school. And then someone would take me under their wing. And every time one student somewhere would feel bad and they would share half their lunch with me, which was so nice. And um, so I came home complaining that I need food. I need a real lunch. And my father just beat the shit out of me. <laughs> I mean, the things he beat me over were very disturbing mental things. They were not like normal. You know, it's like, what was I doing? All I was saying was I need food. <laughs> and I have to say to all you listeners out there, I, I I grew up in a vegan diet as a child, and I want you to know it is the worst thing you could ever do to your child. Children need fat. If you don't want to give them meat or you want to be a vegetarian, fine. But they need all the other products. They need that for their brain development. They end up looking, which is what I look like, it was like a head and just a skinny body. My relatives used to call me Twiggy. Now I'm fat because I, once I was free to eat my own food, I wanted to be able to eat everything. <laughs> But that's what those things do to you when you're later down the road, you know. Well, you came from a very unusual family. As, as you mentioned earlier, your father had served time in prison. He uh, got to know famous gangsters along the way. He was a vegan very early on. There weren't very many vegans back then. And uh, I even recalled seeing a newspaper article about how your father uh, packed up the family from New York and went off to live back in the 1950s, I suppose it was, or early 60s, into a commune in California where you could follow the, the pursue the vegan lifestyle. Well, not just pursue it. You know, my father was a thinking, by the way, for any of you listeners hearing, I loved my father till the ends of the earth and took care of him till the minute he passed on. And I even cremated him and got had to pay extra money to do the cremation myself at the funeral parlor. So when I say we were deeply close and involved, all these stories are there, but there's nothing negative. I just want to be sure the audience knows I never hated my father ever or nothing. I have never was even angry at him. You would have been entitled to be. I, that's true. This is true. Well, he um, was involved with the Theosophical Society. So he was doing all sorts of things. And that's where he found the vegan people. And they had, and they still do today, the Vegan Society is in Malaga, New Jersey. I'll never forget going there as a child because I had never seen toilets in the ground. But they didn't, because they felt that a toilet was not constructed properly for you to use and it really harmed your intestinal tract, you're supposed to be squatting on a toilet. So in, and now they sell something called the Squatty Potty or something. It's like a plastic little thing for people to use. Well, they had, it was porcelain, you know, it's not like a hole in the ground. They had a beautiful home, but the toilets were all in the floor. So the only way you could use it would be to squat over the toilet. They also, on our way to this journey, we were in an a ambulance, a Frankfurter truck, and a 1955 Cadillac. And another family joined us, and we were all coming to live in this commune. 
The head man was Jay Dinshaw, who has passed on, but his wife, Freya Dinshaw, is, I believe, still alive, because I think I saw her on a website. She was the most, she was from England with, she was like having a Mary Poppins person with the accent, and she was, she was, be, she would be my mother, because the parent, my parents were sent out to be workers. It was a real commune, not a hippie kind of commune. It was a real commune that every Sunday we had guests from all over the world that would come and speak there. The garlic man came, you know, discussing garlic. We had people discussing UFOs. Nobody was showing you a picture of a flying saucer in 1962. And my brother was raised on carrot juice. We had no milk. We had no bread. You know, we didn't we didn't have any processed foods of any nature. And my mother's job was she would work at I think it was either Dr. Benish or Dr. Shelton. I can't remember. But she was the person who made all the fresh juices when people would break their fasts. And when we grew up with my dad like this, if you were sick, you weren't given an aspirin or given any kind of medical intervention. You were given a bottle of water and said, now you have to fast. And all of a sudden, you'd be just only on water. And in that year that we lived with this commune and these people, I saw amazing healings. Um, when my father was in prison, he was in prison with Wilhelm Reich and um, Frank Costello. Frank Costello being a gangster and uh, Wilhelm Reich being the man of the orgone. And my father said to me, he always felt that, uh, he said he was a very quiet man who kept to himself in his writings. And he said, when he died, he thinks that it was what they call in jail an inside job, where the prisoners are given a sentence a little less if they do something that, you know, can make the person have a heart attack or whatever it is so that they're found dead. All of his things, my father said, that were in there were not given to his family. They were all taken away, all his writings and all the stuff that was in there. Anyway, so my dad, being an unusual guy, he also happened to work in the slaughterhouse there, I think, at the prison at Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. And um, that was when he started to get the feeling that it was not right to eat animals after he'd seen the slaughtering of it. And so that was all the things that brought on this veganism and this new life. And it was at that time a big deal in New York. The Daily News put a whole page about, a whole section about how the family's going to find a new way of living. We were drinking wheatgrass juice then. When people tell me about wheatgrass juice now, my babysitter was a Hindu monk who did yoga all the time. He also molested me. For years, I've never been able to do yoga. I just was like disgusted at the thought of it (laughs) because of his putting me in, putting me in different bizarre, you know, yogic poses and doing his sexual things on me. And I'm only seven years old. So I had this mixed thing of seeing this spiritual guy with the shaved head and the beads and the robe. And he would do things that also I think developed my psyche which is we would we would read cards together and he would take a deck of cards and I would hold up each card and he'd be able to tell me what card I was looking at. So then he would teach me to do that. He taught me how to play chess. So there were these very positive things that came beside the negative one of you should never be molesting a seven-year-old child. So I think that I've always sort of looked at what was the good that came out of these things. And... Um, his name was Swami of Etananda Saraswati. And like, I've never, I can't remember somebody's name I met yesterday, but that name I can never forget from seven years old. So that exposure to all that different open-minded and alternative thinking, that's not what was going on in other people's houses. You know, my friends didn't grow up with those kind of exposures. I, I'm grateful to all the craziness that happened at the time, <laughs> but that, you know, my dad, we were talking about illegal things. My mother and father were car thieves. They stole cars in New York, and that's what he went to prison for. Well, Jay Dinshaw's father went to prison also because he built and sold in this country machinery called color therapy. And color therapy was not allowed to be used in the United States because there was no money in it and doctors didn't want it here. But in Europe, it was being used widely in different countries with no problems. So he went to prison for these machines, but we had one in our commune. So when my dad was given the instructions that he was to teach Swami how to drive a car, 
Swami and him are in the car and Swami decides Yogananda's calling him. So he just let go of the steering wheel and just went into like closing his eyes and they were on Highway 395. So they had a severe accident. My father came home in the ambulance that we drove cross country and that was supposed to be like a kid mobile so you could stretch out and play games and everything. And he was bandaged from head to toe. His ribs were broken. His toe was turned around. He, he had, had had a severe concussion. And Jay Dinshaw got him from the hospital and did not allow any medical intervention. He said, you can bandage him up, but that's it. We're taking him out of here. They said, if you leave him here in six months, he'll be walking again. He'll be able to work again. And they said, no, no. And they put him in a dark room in the basement of the house we were living in, in Escondido. And I love my father so dearly. I was sitting by his bedside every day in the dark, hoping for him to get better. My daddy, you know, and he'd say when they would put the red color sheet of glass in the machine, it was just a light bulb in a wooden machine that stood up and you had different colors of glass designated for different healings and for different issues. He said when they put the red one on, he said he would not be in any pain. So for six weeks, he fasted on water. He stayed in the dark room and they put this machine on him different times. <laughs> After six weeks, he was back in the gas station, working under cars, taking engines out of vehicles and completely back in perfect health. So in that growing up place, I saw amazing healing. And when you see that, it's very different than being told this happened. When you're there living it and watching it and seeing that healing can be done without medical intervention some of the time, there are places where it is great to have a hospital to go when you've been your arm cut off or your whatever, but then there's other things that can be done, other modalities of healing. And of course, we're not allowed to have that in this country, the color therapy machine, but I saw it heal and I saw it happen before my very eyes. Another fascinating aspect of your childhood or your teenage years, at least, let's, let's say, is, is that you were exposed to psychedelic drugs at an early age. Yes. I think that also helps to open your consciousness to further the idea that maybe there's more in the invisible that we can't see, but is really there. And um, <laughs> the problem I had was... I took my first trip when I was, I think, 14 years old. I had started smoking pot when I was 12. And we lived in a neighborhood where, in Flushing, New York, where there was a park nearby called Bound Park. And that's where all the drug thing was happening. In, at that time, in the early 70s in New York, late 60s, it was always the parks where people would gather to you know, buy and sell drugs or whatever they'd be doing there, meet up with their friends. And so I was given something called mescaline, which I think is the chemical derivative of peyote. Interesting, I'd end up with the wheat holes later, who are the, considered the people of the peyote. And I happened to have, well, never mind. But anyway, so I um, was with my, my friend Ricky, who I went to Woodstock with, who became my boyfriend later. And we both decided that I was seeing a therapist in Manhasset that was being paid for by a church organization because I happened to mention that I saw things and heard things and everybody thought that meant you were crazy, but really for me it wasn't, it was a spiritual thing. And um, so we got out of the therapist's office, we got on the Long Island Railroad to head to Manhattan, not knowing that that's not really where you go to when you take a psychedelic drug, you're best off to be in nature. But we had each other and didn't think anything of it and we both dropped the drug and by the time we get off the subway and start walking down the streets where the huge New York Public Library was, we were tripping our asses off. And we had the best time of our life, like we were in a little bubble in Manhattan and nobody else could come into that bubble, just the two of us. And we went into stores and we, I even have a photo of it that's one of the few photos I have as a kid, wearing a Nehru shirt, tripping my ass off on the streets of New York. Went home in a crowded subway and I don't know and I think of it now how I would never do anything like that but at the time it all seemed to to work I didn't take my first LSD until I came to San Francisco 
And again, it was with my same boyfriend, but he was my boyfriend now, Ricky. And he was dodging the draft and we had the FBI looking for us uh, because he was a draft evader, was supposed to go to the Vietnam War. So being psychic really helped then because I would dream when the FBI would come to my house in New York, I would have the dream in California and I'd wake up and saying, oh my God, men with suits were at the door, la la la, and then I'd get a call. They were here asking questions, you know. So Ricky and I are having our first San Francisco ex experience and this group of real hippie, you know, San Francisco born hippie people whose names were not their real names were Watha and Warland. So they were like witches and whatever. They were very crazy. They invited us to take a trip with them in Golden Gate Park. And we had never done LSD, which was a, a whole step, you know, it's like from drinking a beer or a whiskey. I mean, the difference of strength was tremendous. And I've never taken a whole hit of any psychedelic. I've only taken a small amount because for me, I end up talking to dead people and teenagers didn't understand what would be going on. And I'd be saying, but I'm seeing this and this is happening. And they would only be into sort of like the music and the colors, but I was having expanded like spiritual things going on. So I wished, you know, I don't recommend that teenagers be doing psychedelics. I recommend that if they ever do do a psychedelic at whichever age in their older years that they decide, they should do that with a guide or somebody who knows what they're doing. But back then, that's not how it was. It's just like the, it was free sex, free drugs, and everything was flowing. And you, everything, you know, if you tell them, oh, yeah, you met the guy, you had sex that day, you didn't even hardly know his name, didn't see him again the next day. I mean, that's the kind of lifestyle that was going on. You, it was not a judgmental, oh, you're a bad person. It's, it's the way it was. And that's how the drugs were. The drugs were flowing everywhere. I found LSD to be much too powerful for me. Um, I did it a couple of times. You know, maybe I've tripped under 10 times in my entire life. I did not do another psychedelic. The last psychedelic I took on an intentional big trip was when I was 17. And then I never did it again until I was in the mountains of Mexico with the Huichol Indians. And I was told that I would never be offered peyote during the ceremonies because I was a white outsider. But within 15, and I was the only white person there, but within 15 minutes, an elderly Weechol woman grabbed my arm and said, no, you have to be part of the ceremony. And the next thing I knew, I had to drink some peyote and I had to eat some peyote. But I did it all in very minute amounts so that I just sort of had, you know, a little bit of a high from it. And then one day, I think in my 40s, I once a day, my husband and I took a mescaline trip together. And it was the first time I took an actual dose of a psychedelic in all those years. And we were in my orchard. And when I started to come on to the psychedelic experience of this, I realized, I said, oh my God, this is no different than all the things I've been doing for the last umpteen years when I didn't do any psychedelics. So I discovered that I could have these out of body experiences without a drug but when I tried the drug, I said, oh, it does that also. <laughs> so it was a really good teaching to know that, yes, this drug can do this for you. This can take you into these other fields and areas, but that they were the fields and areas and places I'd gone to naturally without any drug. So that would be my psychedelic story. <laughs> I did have one psychedelic experience that I thought was a very amazing thing. And it was with a woman I babysat for who said she wouldn't take, try uh, mescaline or anything unless I did it with her and her husband because she felt I had to be there. It was an unusual request from a babysitter, you know? <laughs> and we sat, stood in her living room and no one of the person that I've ever tripped with did I ever have this kind of experience. I was probably about 16 and a half maybe at the time I came back to visit from California. And we traveled anything we thought of, all of a sudden, our consciousness would be in that thing. Like she said, I wonder what it's like to be inside a plant. And as soon as she said that, all three of us, me, her and her husband, are going up the stems of a plant into the leaves. And I tell you, I saw every molecular, cellular, tiny thing inside that makes it up. And as I'm looking at it, 
the other persons would say, do you see that green shaped oval thing? You know what I mean? So we were voicing what each other was seeing and we were all seeing together and traveling together. It was an amazing experience, but I've never had that with any other people that I ever, I think it's because she was a special human being that we were able to do this deep connection like that. I am hearing a lot about microdosing now and that it's giving therapy and helping for people where they take small amounts. And I believe uh, psilocybin mushrooms is the most used for this. And I'm sure some of you viewers have been hearing about it. I think that it's amazing and wonderful that something like this is coming to the surface to be able to help people where they wouldn't have to live on a depression drug for the rest of their life. So that's my psychedelic story. <laughs> Oh, and I did, of well, course, get to meet Timothy Leary and spend time with him and et cetera. But that's a later down the road psychedelic stories. <laughs> and I hope to have you back on New Thinking Aloud where we can share more of these stories. I know that you're full of many, many interesting tales. Uh, b before we close the interview, I think it would be very useful to talk about how you came to the attention of professional parapsychologists like Russell Targ and Dean Radin. Okay. That's one of my favorite stories. My husband, David, was working at a company called Interval Research. And every, in fact, anything I tell you has a story. That's why it is hard. <laughs> so the fact that David, who I met when he was 10 and I was 12, and his mother was my algebra teacher, we didn't see each other or know anything about each other for 23 years. And he calls me after a high school reunion and I end up having a child and marrying him is pretty, <laughs> it was really quite a surprise. Uh, but it's because of him. I have to give him all the credit because I would have never met these people. But at Interval Research, it was a think tank that was founded by Paul Allen, who was one of the richest men in the world at the time. And it was set aside to run for 10 years, but he ended up closing it at seven and a half years. And everyone that was working there were people all around the country who knew brilliant other minds. And I'm not sure who brought Russell and Dean in, but my husband's office was two doors down from Russell and Dean's. And he got, let's see, he started there in 1995. And Russell and Dean came on in 1998, I believe. Could have been 97, somewhere in there. And he gets one of these. It was either um, an announcement on their Friday night soiree before the end of the work week would be over. Or it was an email. I can't remember. And it said, we're looking for subjects here in the company to participate in our uh, psychic phenomena research experiments. And... David said, well, could it be someone like my wife who doesn't actually work here? You know, when you went there, you had to sign a special thing and get a special badge. And, you you know, you couldn't go into certain places because they were doing whatever their secret work was. So David says, I'm not sure if what you're looking for is my wife, but she does things like this. She said, he said, the other day I was, we were sleeping. She wakes up and says, I just had a dream. And in the dream, I got a phone call from our housekeeper that does the cleaning on Thursdays. And she said she can't come because her son is throwing up. He's not well. He said, lo and behold, 30 minutes later, the phone rings. He says, and it's the cleaning woman. And she says, I can't come in to clean for you this week. My son is here throwing up all over. Is that what you're looking for? And they said, yes, you know, uh, we'd like to interview her. So... I mean, I have I have so much to thank Russell and Dean for because I had never thought of my psychic life being a psychic life. I only thought about this is how I live. There's nothing special about it. It's just the way I am. But when they said that I had to write down, they wanted me to bring in a selection of psychic stories. Well, I think I was in 40 something then. I said, I never wrote down a psychic story. I didn't know. I'd never even thought about it. So my niece, Valerie, who's just been the most wonderful, she was one who turned me into an aunt, most wonderful niece, she sat at the computer and she titled it Psychic Auntie Gail. 
And I would just think of stories and she would quickly type it in. And by the time we finished, just off the top of my head, we had 10 pages of psychic stories. So I come into interval research and I'm all nervous and they're in one of these, you know, in one of those fancy big conference tables. And they sat down and they said the interview would only be for like, you know, 30, 40 minutes. Two and a half hours later, <laughs> Dean said, we should have videotaped this. Because as I was reading the stories from my pages, more stories were popping up. So at the end, they say, okay, well, we have to stop now. And we go outside the door and Russell goes and he says, I want to get something for you. And he goes and gets me his newest book he's just written. And he gives it to me like this. And he says, you know, you should really write a book. Then Dean takes me on the side and says, yes, you're definitely someone we'd like to have come in and work on some of our experiments with us. And you know what? You should write a book. So all my life I'd been told you should write a book. But I always just figured it was because people, you know, they say something nice. But when two scientists said it, I said, you know what? And I went back home. And even though I'd only finished the ninth grade and had never gone back to school, really, um, and had no idea how to write a book, I sat down and said, well, I'll just write it chronologically. And it took me six months and I wrote 350 pages from the beginning to the end with no guidance on how to do this. But the fact that they said I should do it, and because of that, I did. Then I sort of let it sit around for 20 years, and, that, and Russell keeps telling me, you know, I really think you should publish that book. When are you getting it published? <laughs> so um, it's getting a new life and a new revising with my podcast that's going to be launched tomorrow and having these interviews with wonderful people like you. And I'm hoping somewhere, somehow, there's like a magical thing that happens and someone says, you know, I think we should publish this book or something magical will come from it. That's, you know, kind of the hope for that. And um, because of that, Russell and I started having lunch because I would do two remote viewings uh, a visit because I was driving 100 miles there to do these for them because I live up here in Sebastopol. So he said, he talked to Interval, he said, we have to pay her something. So they paid me $100 to cover my gas and expenses for driving back and forth. And we were doing these and doing more and more. And at each lunch, Russell and I would talk and I would tell him stories and he would tell me stories. And our friendship blossomed from the lunches over that. And then at same thing with Dean, it, they became my friends. And so, you know, I mentioned in their book or they tell somebody, I think you should call her. She might be a good person for this or, and my whole like world opened up to this amazing, that's how I met you. If it wasn't for Russell and Dean not introducing me to all these amazing people, but I also felt like a wonderful connection when I met you. It wasn't like just an introduction. It was like, oh, I love this Jeffrey Mishlove. I hope he'll be in my life forever. And now we're back together again, reconnected here. <laughs> Well, yes, indeed. And I, I remember you working on that book way back then. I'm delighted to know that uh, it's still progressing. I'm so happy to be able to share with our viewers your new podcast. We'll link to it. So uh, if people check the written description associated with this video, they'll find a link to your podcast. Gail, I, I'm looking forward to future discussions. We haven't even begun to talk about your adventures in in uh, Mongolia or uh, in the Philippines or uh, really details of, of your work with the Huichol Indians. So I know we'll have much more to talk about. Gail Hasten, thank you so much for being with me today. It's been just, I could talk with you forever. So I look forward to our next visit together. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. Thank you.